Hello and welcome to the Trophy Lounge from Trophies on PSN. This is Kryptonite Dragon. I'm joined tonight by Dante Zero and we'll be filling in for IDP for Life. Woohoo! He's Woo getting his uh, twice this week now. Yep, he's getting a. We got an extra dose of us, I guess, this week. Yeah. But we do what we can to help out our, our fellow trophy hunters and podcasters and see what we can do to uh, present some news for him for the Trophy Lounge. And uh, see if we can be an inspiration for maybe some new techniques and things to try. So here we are, we're off. What do you got for us tonight, Dante? Uh, well, I, I don't know if we ever agreed on this, but maybe we should talk a little bit about the, the, the fallout from the Xbox stuff. Yes, I guess we did mention that we thought about that. And, um, yeah, um, without going back into it, we had a little bit of a technical difficulties with our podcast again, which hopefully we rectified with some new software. Um, that we're also running at the same time. Uh, but to make a long story short, um, obviously we were not real happy with what we said, uh, or, or what they said, and what we saw. And uh, we take it from there to um, the next couple of days uh, that followed it. it. certainly had a lot of repercussions and a lot of comments around. Um, I spent uh, several hours the other night actually reading around the internet just to see what people had to say. And... Um, uh, I found a lot more negative than than positive. What about you? Yeah, I'm still shocked that even like two, two and a half, three days later, and uh, it's still not looking good. Um, I don't know. It just seems the more they Microsoft talk, the, the bigger the hole they dig themselves in. And you know, as you say, we've seen the repercussions of that from things like share prices and stuff. You know, that that was intriguing to see that. And you would have thought that. Um, you know, after a couple of days, that all that would have died down, but it hasn't. It's still going on fiercely. It's just a PR disaster. Mm. Yeah, it's. Um, I think there's. You know, the big thing that struck me was there's a lot of confusion. Um, you know, not being able to to get clarification on the the always on some of the things with the prices and use games, all that stuff. Like a lot of people are. Uh, you know, very vocal about, no, that's not how it works, and, and, you know, their views are conflicting, and they're just, you know, it's causing a lot of turmoil where people are just, you know, trying to call each other out. Um, so, you know, maybe maybe even, we don't know the facts, I don't know, you know, it could have been one of these things that maybe there's some more clarification that's going to come out of E3 on a lot of this stuff, but it sure seems like there's a lot of Sony execs, and, or not Sony execs, Microsoft execs, that have come out and said, you know, this is the way it will work, or this isn't the way it'll work. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think it's I think it's interesting to see the uh, the the conflict between you know all the different parties and you know yeah, yeah. It, it, and that, that 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 in itself just sums up the whole sort of press conference and the confusion because what people were expecting a next gen games machine you know effectively <laughs> getting a next gen cable box that's you know can play games and you know for Microsoft to misjudge their audience and their audience to then sort of be confused about that and then to extend that confusion even further you've got um, your fans and your consumers you know taken to Twitter and social networks to ask these questions then you've got Phil Harrison saying one thing another Sony exec saying another and the Twitter account you know contradicting both of them and it's like if you're sat there as a Microsoft fan or you know, intending to purchase the new Xbox One, you, you, you don't have a clue what's going on. It doesn't paint a very good light for for Microsoft at all. <laughs> yeah, you said but, Sony. I mean, you, the, you the said Sony again in there, too. <laughs> we keep saying Sony. We want to say Sony instead of Microsoft. What is it about that? Is that fanboyism peeking out? I don't know, maybe. Um, but, yeah, I think it's clearly, it's a lot more um, Xbox on Xbox hate. You know, it's um, Xbox users arguing with other Xbox users, and that's uh, that's pretty crazy. Because, you know, you're going to get the fanboy stuff, you're going to get it from the Wii U, and even the PC people are pe peeking their head in going, you know, for all these costs and stuff, you can get a PC, and you can use it for regular stuff on the Internet for around 500 bucks, and, you know, all that the usual stuff that comes out with this kind of thing, but... You know, um, well, you, you, I didn't you, expect you, to see so many Xbox people fighting other Xbox people. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you could tell that, um, you know, they, they completely lost themselves within the PR nightmare because uh, I don't know if you saw this crop up on, in a news article on one of the sites um, that somebody tweeted at Xbox, uh, the, the Xbox Twitter account made a joke 
um, they said, uh, God, TV is so boring these days, I just find it so challenging um, to use. Now I finally have my solution, Xbox One, hashtag, yeah? And it was obviously meant as a sarcastic remark. Um, Microsoft then took that tweet without asking the permission of the person that tweeted it and actually put that on Xbox.com as an advert <laughs> with the person's Twitter name and all that. And I, I just thought, you really have lost the plot because you're so busy trying to, you know, uh, kill the flames of rage that's come as a result of the conference that you haven't even realised your sense of humour, uh, people's sense of humour when it comes to jokes and stuff. Because, you know, prior to the press conference, there was actually a lot of joking going on between Sony execs and Microsoft ones. Hmm. And it's, it's strange that as soon as the basically the crap hit the fan after the press conference, it was like... <laughs> what, they've totally lost their sense of humour now? <laughs> and they're just posting whatever they can, you know... It, it, I don't know, for the last two days it seems like it's been damage control and even then it still hasn't done yeah, them, yeah. them Well, on the, on the tech side, there's a lot of tech sites and things like that that, that were like, wow, this is, this is pretty great. Um, you know, they're seeing through a lot of the, you know, the usefulness and stuff that for the TV and everything is apparent to them. And, they're, you know, the, a lot of them are, you know, of a lot better of a, opinion of the next Xbox. And, uh, you know, so there, there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of love there. Uh, but at the same time, when everything's said and done, I think, you know, what speaks the, 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 the most to me was hearing about Sony and Nintendo's stock going up. Yeah. And uh, and it didn't just have an impact on Microsoft as well with their share price going down and Sony and Nintendo's going up. It actually had a negative impact on GameStop's shares as well. Yeah, they had to uh, talk GameStop about the used games. GameStop's actually went down. Yeah. <clears throat> well, if uh, used games and stuff get restricted and blocked, then, um, you know, if you charge full price to use a used game, then that means used games are... they don't exist. Yeah. Well, I said to you uh, on the day when we were talking, uh, I said it's kind of funny because one of the websites had actually done an interview with the CEO of GameStop, um, you know, shortly after the conference. And since then, you know, that's the only retail outlet that's had anything to say about it. Mm -hmm. You know, all the other retailers are, are keeping shum about it because they're probably still trying to work out what it means for them and their business. Because, you know, if some of the other stuff that Microsoft was saying, it could kill off a lot of um, businesses within the industry, which, as we know, is, is never good for anyone. Mm -hmm. Well, and then you'll have the, the legitimate thing that will happen will be, you know, the GameStops of the world will uh, tout the, the PlayStation 4 over the Xbox One every day of the week. You know, they'll, they'll go hardcore to kind of a, a campaign of, of putting that to the forefront, you know. Yeah. Out of self-preservation, they'll do that. Um, they'll force them to become, you know, uh, exclusive to <laughs> to recommending yeah. that. So, I don't know. It's, yeah. it's, uh, it's and crazy. And obviously, the developers and publishers follow suit after that because it's a case of, well, you know, um, retailers sell their products. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if retailers are having to push one platform just to survive, publishers and developers traditionally are going to, you know, support the retailers as much as they can because, you know, that's an <clears> outlet for their product. Yep, that's and we're still, not, we're still not in a day and age where digital distribution is the be-all and end-all. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. They need a storefront. So, hmm. It's definitely going to be interesting times for it. <laughs> Do you, you think... Know, um, you think we'll see a lot of backpedaling when it comes to E3? You think it'll be, will it be a, a an apology? Will it clear this up? Let us let us get into detail here. Will it be a will it be a backpedal? Will it, they'll say, well, we're going to change this before we put it out? Will I it be a redirection of like, look at our exclusive games and don't worry about that stuff. Let's let that, let's forget about that for now. <laughs> genuinely, I genuinely think it's too late. The damage is done and it's going to stick. And, hmm. and you know, I said this way before. You know, this this conference came up that you know it seems such a strange thing to do it two and a half weeks before E3. You know, um, and the fact that the, you know they could have just come out and said you know about the console what their design ethos was without giving up away too much information in other things, mm -hmm. and that would have given them a bit of leg room so that if 
in terms of it would have let them see the initial response before they gave people more information and they could handle and it all went pear-shaped as it didn't you know in fairness that's what sony did right with their press conference in february they did enough in terms of showing the games they showed off the development actually but they kept some surprises you know what i mean yeah and yeah. so you know that gives sony you know six months to get constant feedback on what people have seen and whether or not any of that feedback's implemented it can be implemented into the unit before it goes on sale uh microsoft has screwed themselves now because they've got to show up with a unit that's not very popular and not very well received in two and a half weeks time and they're mm. not going to have enough time to change any of it well maybe maybe my perception of why they were having this conference so close to e3 and separate from e3 but yet so close maybe in their mind that was the tv reveal and then maybe e3 is just gaming and I think that they missed the idea that hardcore gamers, you know, are the ones that are going to watch these kind of press conferences and stuff like that. Someone that's using it for TV or that plans to use it for TV, they don't even know about that, that kind of functionality unless they're also a gamer. And yeah, but all that then says to me is that Microsoft, you know, effectively then marketed that press conference completely wrong then. Because, yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. They, they were talking about not just the, ne the next generation of entertainment, the next generation of gaming, you know, that was all on their marketing spiel and all that. Uh, and really, um, you know, they wanted to focus on TV, you know, they have been trying to drive their, their core gaming audience to watch this press conference. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it showed that they obviously got it all wrong because of the reaction efforts. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I generally think it's too late for them to actually do anything about that. They can quite, quite douse the flames as much as they want, but the damage is already done. Definitely a direction change. So, well, maybe the steam box will come along and... <laughs> yeah. Who knows? All right, well, what, else, what else is going on in the gaming world? Let's, let's, um, let's uh, do some other things in the news here, and let's let... Uh, well, at least give Daryl a chance to speak his mind about what he thought about the Xbox. And, you know, I, we've already uh, <laughs> vented Jeez. about how bad it was. Um, I'm going to be putting out a funny little video probably That's later scary. tonight. So, <laughs> so, so yeah, you um, definitely got to watch that. So first on, let me let me go through. We got Fuse is coming out. It's an action game from Insomniac. That'll be out May 28th. Uh, Grid yeah. 2. Racing will also be out uh, May 28th. Yeah. And then that's probably about I've, I've it. I've got to say, I, I'm kind of intrigued by the Fuse thing, but the whole thing that throws me off is EA. I mean, I know there's no online passes for Fuse, but um, we've seen, you know, from Ratchet and Clank all for one. You know, it's not that Insomniac can... Insomniac made bad games, but in the case of Ratchet and Clank, all for one, they kind of missed the audience and they went too far away from what it is that people like about Insomniac. And I wonder if, uh, you know, that makes me worry a little bit for whether or not Fuse is going to actually be any good or not. Yeah. Hmm. You know, I've heard, I've heard um, conflicting things left, right and centre, so it'd be interesting to see how people perceive it, you know, react when it does come out. Um, because, uh, as I say, you know, it's, it's weird to, how, to see how Insomniac have fallen from grace a little bit over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, before they had the Resistance series, which was extremely popular, um, even Resistance 2 was, and then Resistance 3 came out, and it was, you know, it, it wasn't what people expected in terms of, you know, the, the basic quality they expected. Uh, and then obviously to come out with Ratchet and Clank all for one, and then the negative press about Q-Force and the fact that, you know, the Vita version of Q-Force has only just released six months later than it should have. Hmm. You know, yeah. um, it'll, it'll be, be interesting, interesting to see whether or not EA actually stick with uh, Insomniac as a third-party publisher, um, with their other endeavours, or Insomniac going to go back to doing what they do best, which is first-party exclusives. Yeah, yeah. As for Grid, personally, I'm not too bothered about it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. The Gran Turismo's and stuff of the world like have seemed to knock some of these other racing games kind of out of the out of the spotlight. I guess you would say. Um, yeah. You know, that's my feeling at least. Um, things like well, this. Were... I, I, I've played a lot of Codemaster games um, over the last couple of years, and you know, 
code masters know how to make a game uh, in some respect they just don't know how to execute it properly if that makes sense in terms of just basic graphics for example and stuff like that i mean grid 2 look, looks good but no doubt there'll be flaws in there that will, that will, will ruin it for people and that's the problem with it uh code masters is that they can make games they just don't seem to be continually improving upon it yeah well, there's there's a lot of dramatic things with racing. For one, it's like, uh, for me anyway, there's not. It, you're you're just working a piece of equipment, and 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 I noticed a lot of things. Like I know it sounds out of place, but um, like I, I was playing the Need for Speed the other night, the game night, and and you're driving around town, and you're doing all this stuff, and blah blah blah. It not a single person walking on the streets. Not a single. Not you know what I mean? It's like. Yeah. It, little things like that where it's just kind of like, mm. yeah, in fairness, I think you'll probably see. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Cause I, Racing I games are always they're either locked into race tracks and things like that, or when they do the street races, it's always, um, you know, it's like, yeah, like smash up do, is in there. Yeah, like, but if you do like street races and there's people on the side of the streets and you run them over, for example. Then you get into the whole Grand Theft Auto thing. Yeah. Sort of well, you know what I, I mean? It's more than that. It's more. It's the experience. Yeah. Like, you slam into a yeah. wall, your car disappears, and then it reappears, yeah, and it's fixed, one, yeah. and you're you're moving forward, and you're continuing on the race, and, and you're kind of like, yeah. did I die? Was the, <laughs> you're like, yeah. what happened? You know, um, it's so... Well, that's the arcade racer for you, though. Yeah. I think the problem I've seen so far is that too many arcade racers for example are trying to be something they're not and they're trying to they're trying to blend it between serious simulator races um and the arcadeness and you know, yeah. it kind of worked with need for speed shift um it didn't really work with need for speed shift 2 um mm -hmm. you know they, they just f fell flat with that so it shows you that there's such a fine line between you know blending those two together well that's another thing using the using a controller and then somebody else is a Hardcore, they've got a racing, you know, wheel and and all that stuff. Yeah. And then you ask sure them how the, yeah, yeah, you ask them going between <laughs> games, and it's like, well, yeah, I can play Gran Turismo Five with a wheel and all that, and it's it's awesome. And then I go to another one, and like, it turns so tight that I like turn left and slam into a wall, make a ninety degree <laughs> turn, you know. It, these, that's what I mean. I mean that they're so, it's a difficult, that's a difficult genre. I can't even imagine trying to make a game and make it, make it work and and make it. Um, I don't know, feel right, and you know what I'm yeah. saying? It's just, yeah. I don't know, driving's a different experience than anything else. Yeah. And most of us, you know, you do a shooter and stuff, you've never, you know, been in combat, and you wouldn't know what that's really like anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, racing, most of us have, you know, experienced what a car's like, and... <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. Oh, I mean, Tough I'm genre. Not go Tough too genre. Much in that, uh, painful, painful memories, my driving. driving yes, indeed. So far. <laughs> so far. Hopefully they'll get better. Yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah. No, I think both games will probably do fairly well sales-wise. I think you know they'll be fairly well received. But to be honest with you, I'm kind of waiting for them to hit the bargain bin. Um, I, I don't think they're sort of games that you you look at and you you must go buy. But nevertheless, at least it'll give um, it'll provide a stop gap stop gap to some of the games that are out at the beginning of June. So cool, cool. They look fantastic. All right, you got some other uh, some other news items to touch upon. Uh, well, yeah, we were talking about obviously racing games, so uh, uh, yes, yeah, so obviously we should probably get that out of the way with uh, obviously the new Need for Speed game. Uh, it's called uh, I think it's called Need for Speed Rivals. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, there's been obviously a number of screenshots released. Uh, the funny thing is, a lot of the screenshots are actually um, high-res uh, versions of the next-gen engine. Um, running the Need for Speed things, but at the moment it's only pretty much been confirmed for PS3 and Xbox 360, um, and that they're going to be doing some. They'll be providing some info um, in regards to the next gen plans and the you know prior to E3, round about E3 time. What's interesting though is they're not talking about the video version, which is strange because uh, Need for Speed is extremely popular and very successful on the Vita because they managed to essentially port the full console experience onto a handheld with very minor um, compromises. You know, uh, I hear I'm pretty proud of that. Hmm. Um, so if there's a new need for speed game, why is that not coming to be here? Hmm. It's interesting. 
But, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, there's not, not been a lot of details, to be honest, with regards to Need for Speed Rivals. So uh, I, I imagine the focus will, if it's Rivals, the focus will be pretty much on, you know, expanding the autologue experience that we've seen coming to the Need for Speed things. And, and maybe, probably, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if they've stole a little bit of... Uh, imagination from uh, what tr- what PS4 exclusive drive clubs are trying to do, you know, with the whole social thing. Oh, yeah, social yeah. Driving clubs. It, it really wouldn't surprise me if uh, Need for Speed Rivals is is kind of like EA's stab at trying to compete with something like that. Mm-hmm. Definitely that may be interesting. It may very well be. Good hmm. But having seen the screenshots, I've got to be honest, it does look pretty impressive. Yeah, I mean, we're going to see a lot of people using, like, <laughs> you know, they're going to be using next-gen console uh, equipment and stuff, or just like you mentioned the other day, I mean, they could be using, you know, I don't know, PC architecture or something worth. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to, it's always hard to judge sometimes that advanced advanced stuff, and, hmm. Yeah. Well, one, the one, one thing's for sure, though, I mean, like most Need for Speed reveals, this one's been kind of positive. Uh, people haven't been hating on the whole yearly Need for Speed thing. Um, they, they obviously see there's some potential with the idea of Need for Speed Rivals. So, you know, it certainly gives me something to look forward to with the uh, EA's press conferences, um, you know, coming during E3. Um, you know, a new Need for Speed game um, would definitely, definitely be one to, you know, really kick off EA's... Um, brand relaunch if you see what I mean because obviously they've had all the negative thing they've got a new CEO now they've talked about getting rid of online passes um, and you know this would be the next step in saying well this is the first game that we really want to champion this non, non, none of this nonsense online pass system and all that and really get fans back to liking EA the way it used to be yeah, yeah believe it or not people did used to like EA before they were the time. most hated company in America <laughs> yeah. I don't care if you're taking my house away, I'm still going to vote for EA. <laughs> so, screw you, Bank of America. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> dear, oh dear, you can tell when people have got their priorities, right? <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, it's it's but, whoever makes the biggest commotion because they can't really, you know, can't make everybody vote. But... Yeah. Um, oh, we, that was the other thing. We should probably uh, finish that, that that particular news piece on the fact that it's also got a release date as well. Okay. Um, so even though we don't really know much about it, um, it will be out on November the 19th. Cool, cool. Um, for current generation consoles, but obviously we don't know if that's going to apply to the PS4 and uh, the next box. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't want to use the name Xbox One because it just sounds so terrible. Uh, hmm, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I'd expect that version to be out around about the same time, if not a couple of weeks after. So, <laughs> yeah, so not long to wait for brand new Need for Speed if you're a Need for Speed fan. Good news! Cool, 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 cool. What else you got for us? Uh. Pfft. Let's have a look. What do we... Ah, yes. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, I know you didn't particularly want to read this <laughs> one. <laughs> but I think, I think it's important because I, I think this is huge news um, in some respect given the amount of uh, history behind it. And that's obviously Final Fantasy uh, 14 is finally got a PS3 release date. <laughs> you know, this is a game that should have been out on PS3 last summer. Um, and came out on PC, obviously, didn't receive a very good reception um, to the point of where after a couple of weeks they had to shut down the entire game and go back to the drawing room board and you know Square Enix in, in all fairness have sort of over the months of the year have really admitted where the flaws were they've really worked closely um, with their fan base and people that tested the original uh, Final Fantasy XIV client and, and they really have made a big effort to, to really polish this game up um, so, you know, the fact that the Final Fantasy XIV is now a very real thing, because it was about two or three years ago that it was even revealed at E3. <laughs> Who you can know, the, the one where Final Fantasy <laughs> came up on the screen. Who can remember, right? <laughs> it came up Final Fantasy XIV on the screen and everybody, woo, yeah, in the crowd. And then all of a sudden it came up underneath online 
and then everybody just groaned. <laughs> it was like a collective groan from about 300 people watching that, that press conference in the room. <laughs> This is uh, probably one of my funniest memories of E3, but um, yeah, so it's coming out August the 27th, it's got uh, a collector's edition as well, um, which isn't actually too bad, it's around about £58, you get an art book, soundtrack, that kind of thing. Uh, now the interesting thing is, obviously, uh, I don't know if too many people know this, but obviously Final Fantasy XIV uh, is now called uh, A Realm Reborn, um, actually carries a subscription fee, uh, so it's a subscription fee based MMO, uh, it will work out around about £8 a month, uh, or around about €9 Euros a month, uh, and I'm not quite sure that that'll be in dollars. Hmm. No, no probably, it'll probably be about $9, nine or $9.99 in Euro, uh, for, for the guys in the US, but uh, yeah, um, it's interesting to see that actually because if you look at you know when we had that discussion back on the pod station about MMOs and you know we, we've actually now got to the point where um, we actually now have a nice selection. You know you've got Final Fantasy XIV, which if you've watched the trailer of it looks fantastic, the gorgeous looking game which is going to carry a subscription, but then you've got alternatives should you not want to go down that route. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just confused by the the the, the charging so much for the retail disc I mean, I'm wondering if you buy the retail disc um, if there will be any subscriptions included with that yeah it sounds like it probably will be because if you're going to buy it for 40 quid you know and then get it home and the first thing you have to do is then spend another 10 yeah. quid Sign up for I mean, some yeah, I know it's, uh, I know it's, uh, and that's subscription MMOs and you know people that, that buy subscription MMOs are kind of used to that but you know if you really want to get people that are more familiar with consoles into the whole idea of paid uh, paid play MMOs. Well, yeah, you're really, you're really saying MMOs players on PC are used to that. Um, yeah. So, I think but we're, we're definitely going to see a lot more. You, you can feel it. They're coming. I think we're going to see a lot more MMOs. We're going to see a lot more movie crossovers with games and, and television shows, all that. I can just, I can sense it. It's coming. <laughs> Microsoft have their way, it's definitely coming. They have a Last of Us uh, television show and MMO. I would, that comes out I would be against that. <laughs> what about Destiny? That would make a good one. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, we should probably talk about that new story. <laughs> oh. I like the way you segue in these things. I wasn't actually segueing. That was an accident. <laughs> <laughs> Accidental segues. Still segues. Uh, but yeah, uh, today... Um, we saw the first proper trailer for Destiny. It was a live, I think it was a live action CGI one, wasn't it? Uh, well, no, it had some actors and, I don't know, was it CGI? It was pretty good. It was pretty clear if it was. Yeah, I, I think there was some CGI bits and it spliced in with real live action stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah, it was, it was spliced. Yeah, because that's that one actor, uh, I don't know his name. Yeah. Oh, I was Did you say. say it was like directed by John Favreau or something like yeah, that? Yeah, it was. It was. It was directed by Favreau. You want to tell people about who that is? <laughs> uh, well, for those of you that don't know, I mean, he's involved a lot with Marvel, and uh, he's directed uh, some of the Marvel movies and uh, like that. You know, the Iron Man and stuff. Iron Man Two. I was mentioning how I watched a little bit of Iron Man Two recently, and I'm getting all pumped up again for all that. You know, I'm a big freaking Marvel comic hero junkie, so <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be looking forward to Thor later this year then. Oh, I'm gonna, you know, I watch all of them. I watch. I still all need them. to watch Iron Man three, but anyway, Destiny. <laughs> They're all cool. Uh, the trailer looked pretty good. Um, I think, as far as teaser trailers go, it didn't give too much away. You know, I think we've, we, I think by now most gamers know what Destiny is. Mm-hmm. Um, what was intriguing about it was more towards the end of the, the, the trailer that got me and you know um, that really did surprise me because I think people need to realize with Destiny that's the next big thing for Activision it really is I mean you know they Activision has sort of cottoned on to the fact that the COD um, you know at some point the COD bubble is going to burst well they'll, they'll have to keep reinventing it and it'll get old that way because it's like you know, they've already done that somewhat you know uh, yeah. obviously but you can only reiterate that 
mo- you know, that mode of, of combat kind of thing so many times with... So you can see why they've invested in Bungie, really. I mean, you know, um, from, from that side of things. Yeah. And, you know, um, even Ghosts, you know, I, I, don't, I don't mean to interrupt you, but even Ghosts, you know, if you actually look at what the story is about Ghosts, it's really off the rails from, uh, you know, I mean, Black Ops was a kind of a change in direction and it had a lot of more fantasy story related. But Ghosts, if you actually looked at that, it's like, Kind of an end of the world. Uh, apocalypse. Yeah, it's an apop- post-apocalyptic uh, military shooter. You know what the so worst thing would be for that is if you remember a few years ago some of the COD rumors that were doing the rounds as going to be one in space and all that. I wonder if that's <laughs> going to be the next. Yeah. The next Call of Duty. Well, from, you know, uh, I mean, would that would that not make uh, sense? That's where they're headed. Mm. You know, you can only do so many. The modern warfare, you know. That just, it's not going to play out. <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite sure how it's Can't keep bringing a character, keep new characters in and keeping that story alive and keeping it interesting. It'll space go to space. <laughs> yep. It'll, you get to play a space dog in an MMO. <laughs> but, um, back to Destiny. I think, you know, um, Activision have made a, a sensible investment with Bungie with it. I think you know. Mm-hmm. I, I think we're all starting to slowly gather excitement for this persistent on world, online world, um, while it's still a single-player game. You, you know, the, you know the actions of what other people do within their games affect your game and, and so on. I know. I'm still really intrigued about that. Um, that that concept of it, and it seems that Activision bizarrely seems to be siding with. You know, Sony's ethos a little bit with pushing that product. Uh, I think they're happy to keep receiving money um, from from Microsoft to keep pushing out exclusive content for Call of Duty. And in the meantime, uh, they're using Sony as a vehicle to really push uh, what could be a truly innovative game. And you know, one of, as I say, one of the interesting things about that trailer is that we are actually going to see the world's first gameplay because we it is worth pointing out up until this point destiny hasn't re- uh, has only revealed concept art and as we say a teaser trailer effectively but it didn't really show any gameplay um and they're going to be up they're going to be up on the stage with sony e3 mm-hmm. and I, I think that's a huge cue uh coup for, for sony really yeah well you know especially you follow it back bungie was you know, Halo exclusive to Xbox, and yeah. now we're, you know, you're really too, if you're a big company like Activision, you really have to open it up. Even if you do exclusives, you need to, you need to go cross-platform. Yeah, but I, I think it's important Crazy. for Sony in terms of, you know, and both Activision, in terms of that Sony is all about pushing their new IPs, yeah. as well as having the, the standard things, and, you know, Microsoft can learn a thing or two from that, because, you, you know, we we said this before the Xbox One conference is that, you know, uh, if Microsoft didn't really show up with games and um, they only showed up with two brief tri- teasers and the rest were all uh, games that were multi-platform anyway. You know, if I was going to promote my brand new product out in the market, the last thing I'd be using is something like FIFA and, uh, you know, um, Call of Duty to promote my product. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't be reliant on those two, so I, I think it's a very smart move from Activision. Um, I think it's a very smart move from Bungie, and, you know, Sony are going to reap the rewards from that as well. Yep, and nobody will be hating on it like, oh, they used to make Halo, we're not playing them. Nobody will be like yeah. that. <laughs> it'll, it'll draw a lot of people for the next in. Call of Duty Halo. Yeah. <laughs> call of Halo. Call, it, call to Halo. But no, I'm uh, I'm intrigued to see what comes of this. You know, I, I I'm one of those people like I I often see through the advertising. Like I see, you know, I look past all that. And when somebody's just got a bunch of things that are on both consoles, you know, and you talked about this before, like advertisements only on Xbox, you know, and it's oh. like misleading as hell because uh-huh. no, it's not only on Xbox. You're yeah. saying it, but it's not. It's not true. <laughs> and uh, it's, you know. Time to releases, that's the other thing, you know, I mean, all those things just are, it's bad, it, it pr- puts a bad face on it when you're e- easily able to look past it, when you've been exposed to it so much that you actually know, you know, someone tells you it's exclusively on Xbox, and you're like, well, no, it's just delayed release because they paid money to, re- you know, release it 30 days later, you know, that that smacks of, like, um, 
I don't want to say false advertising, but it's kind of like it's it smacks of like they're trying to lead you, and they know. Yeah, yeah but on the flip, flip side, <laughs> you know, um, you know the <laughs> truth. <laughs> Well, 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 no, I was going to say on the flip side, from a gamer's perspective, it's kind of nice for once to actually see Activision support Sony. Because, yeah. let's be honest, if we look back over the last couple of years, um, you know, it's all been COD, 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 and Sony have kind of been, like, you know, scratching their heads, thinking, well, why isn't Activision want to really come on board with us and talk talk about their products with us why they you know okay yes Microsoft paying for it a little bit but you know what more do we have to do to get Activision to appear on a stage with us and talk to it you know talk to our audience as well because at the end of the day even if it's multi-platform game it still needs to be sold to two audiences really and you know that's something Sony has struggled with with Activision over the last couple of years and it's kind of nice to finally see that coming and I think that's going to generate um you know certainly in the playstation fan base uh, i think it's going to de- generate a whole lot of interest in destiny more so than it might have done if they just turned up uh for the microsoft one press conference and did it there mm-hmm. so you know it'll be interesting do you to see think, how that i mean do you think if it is smart. it smart smart tactics for uh you know an activision to to play both sides of the fence like that i mean is that I actually think it is, if you think about it, really. Because, you know, as I said, we, we all know at some point the Call of Duty bubble is going to have to bur- burst. It, it just has to. Um, if it doesn't, that, that, that has huge implica- implications going forward. But, mm-hmm. you know, up until that bubble bursts, you know, Microsoft are quite happily handing over huge, large sums of money. Uh, and, you know, and Activision are making huge profits, but at the same time, you know, Activision know that bubble's going to burst, so they're going to try and make as much money out of it in the meantime while pushing, you know, the next big thing. And, you know, if anyone's going to come up with the next big thing, obviously Activision are the prime candidates to do that. And, you know, when you look at what's going on between the COD series and, you know, the upcoming Destiny, it's actually really clever of Activision to be doing that. Hmm. You know? Well, maybe we're just reading a bit too much into it. I don't know, but... <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I can't see, like... You know, I don't know. I mean, if I, if I just put, put myself in the shoes of, like, if I was a developer or publisher and I had something that... Like Halo, I mean, you, you got to believe, like, at some point they were thinking, well, why don't we just make this for the PS3 also and double our sales? <laughs> you know, it's it's almost like a... <laughs> <laughs> it smacks of like there's there's kind of no logic in it, <laughs> you know. Is is it well, about? I think I think that that poses putting a game out to gamers, or is it about like you know we're in someone's pocket, they pay us money and to well, show up for the press conference, and that's part of doing business as a game company. I think Bungie originally had no choice in the matter because of the exclusivity that deal they had. But you know, I, I I would be interested if someone you know spoke to Bungie and said, "Did you, you know, when you were making these Halo games, did you ever think it's nice to have this working relationship with Sony, but there's a whole um, not Sony with uh, Microsoft, but we're missing a whole audience out there." <laughs> You know, it'd be interesting to see how they thought about that. Get them, get them to the press conference and then ask them. <laughs> Bungie, I'm appearing with Sony. We've got a question for you before we get started. <laughs> Did you think about your relationship with Sony? <laughs> the non-existent one while you were making Halo? Mm-hmm. <laughs> be, be an interesting one to get an answer to. Yeah. I don't know. You would think money would drive it to... Putting it out as many different platforms as you could. Yeah. yeah. Interestingly enough, before we move on to the next bit of news, uh, we should point out that the Destiny trailer is now up on the homepage. So if you do want to check that out, uh, just obviously go to you know the homepage, trophies on PSN.com, and on the front we have like a panel of YouTube, t- uh, YouTube channels or videos. Videos is probably the better way of explaining. We have uh, like four videos on there and we switch them out every every now and again but the Destiny one's on there so you can go and check that out. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy it as much as we did because I, I really like the trailer for it and I really like the, the, the concept of Destiny as well so I'm just hoping uh, when the gameplay reveal comes around at E3 that you know the, the gameplay is actually and the graphics and you know what they're aiming for is really going to be done some justice by what they show. Yeah, definitely. Sounds like one I'll be getting. Yeah. Don't know, you don't really like that persistent online MMO kind of world, though, well, do you? I, you know, At least not anymore. 
Well, uh, you know, I don't know. I'm, I don't know. I, 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 I feel that I'm gonna have to kind of reapproach my thought on that. But yeah. Yeah, the thing is, is like, I, I, there's times where I like, I would love to just get wrapped up in a game and just play it for months and months and months. And then there's other times where it's like, well, I'd rather get back to just playing a game for a little bit and then going on to the next big thing that I like and and mixing it up because. Yeah. It's too easy to just buy one game and then you're just kind of like shut out from all the the latest titles coming out yeah. because there is a really there's a lot to pick from nowadays there really is <laughs> it just keeps there's just a lot it is cases. you know as, as time goes on it's like you know wow mm. okay. I don't even think we can logically use the term second Christmas anymore because it's now extended into June July and August. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you can't be a game player anymore and just, you know, play and play the few GTA. games that you got at Christmas time, and yeah. it's it's almost like that doesn't make sense. <laughs> it's every couple yeah, of months then, you're yeah, buying yeah, a handful of games. Uh, and then you've got GTA 5 in September this year, so as I say, the transition, there's going to be no break uh, month where it takes a break and we don't get at least, you know, one or two big AAA titles, so... Mm-hmm. So, yeah, if I get wrapped up into something, you know, I can't really, I don't know. GTA 5 takes me six months to get a platinum or something like that. Then what? <laughs> I don't uh, know. Four years for me. Also there about. Switch back and forth to the MMOs that I've been playing or something. And so, next story. Let's move on. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, speaking of trailers up on the front page, there's a, another one uh, that's definitely interesting that I think people should check out. Um, a couple of Days before the uh, Microsoft One press conference, uh, Sony Japan Worldwide Studios um, actually teased a trailer for a game at the time we all thought was, uh, you know, um, called Panopticon. Um, it turns out that the project's actually called um, Codename Panopticon, but the, the game's actually now been revealed as Freedom Wars, uh, which ironically um, was actually revealed on the same day as Microsoft's press conference. Um, so surprise, surprise! Obviously, not many, too many people have been talking about this. But having watched the trailer last uh, week, I'm really excited for this. Um, in fact, I was having a conversation with the, the news team about this uh, earlier, um, and, and we safely say that we're all excited about this game because if you watch the trailer, it genuinely looks like a next-generation PS4 game. So it was with much surprise that it was actually revealed to be a multiplayer, eight-player co-op PS video game, mm -hmm. um, which is is actually quite a big surprise. Yeah. Um, Both of them, eight-player co-op, are like, wow. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the concept behind it's pr pretty interesting as well. I won't go into it too much because I think you know um, if you sort of describe the concept before seeing the trailer uh, it might confuse you a little bit so I, I would definitely recommend checking out the trailer and, and then going maybe uh, reading an article on it I think uh, I think Buku knew she's just update her article uh, that she originally did um, when the, the trailer first came out so she, she's putting all the info on there in terms of the concept of the game and stuff so do go and check that up uh, in the uh, news and releases forum of the site um, but yeah I, I think that the concept of a player uh, multiplayer co-op is, is fascinating for the Vita hmm. yeah and I think I think the good thing with it is uh, it comes across as a very big uh, big budget title and you know I'm not dismissing the uh, Sony's focus on indie games of late, especially when it comes to the Vita, because, you know, the indie games have been great, but we're still missing the big AAA titles. You know, the ones that make me want to go out and buy a game on physical... Uh, as a physical retail release, and this is one of those that I, I can genuinely see, me, see myself rushing out and buying, because it looks so damn good. Hmm. And... The funny thing is, with it as well, it's got that kind of old school Square Enix feel to it as well. Nice. You know, a bit, a bit, a bit of Square Enix mixed in with a bit of uh, what Level Five are doing these days, and coming from Sony. And the other interesting thing is, obviously, that you know, Sony back in the day used to be pretty damn good at making you know RPGs and JRPGs. Mm -hmm. And you know, as we went into sort of uh, you know the second half of the PS2 era, they 
they kind of slowed down. They didn't really do a lot more with them. And then we've we we, we haven't really seen any RPGs from Sony um, over the years of PS3. Um, so it's good to see that Sony Japan are getting back to, to to what they do best, which is RPGs. And you know, uh, I really hope that Freedom Wars um, is going to be the first step for them on that. Uh, I really do, and I hope it's going to be especially successful because, you know, from what I've seen so far, it looks fantastic. Hmm. Cool, cool, cool. I don't know. Did you, you did you get a chance to check out the trailer yourself? Yeah, a little bit. I didn't watch the whole thing, uh, and I had the sound turned off. Um, well, I was actually I was I was trying to kind of make sense of some of the language that was in there. There was some text on the screen, and I was trying to read it, and I was like, uh, that didn't really translate well to English. <laughs> But, um, yeah, I mean, it, uh, you know, the only thing I can say is that, like, I like RPGs a lot, um, but, you know, sometimes that flair from the, the Japanese side of it, eh, I don't know. I don't, I won't say that it's, it's something that I really love. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to tick off any JRPG fans or anything like that, but when you say yeah. it's got a little flavor of that, that's kind of one of those things like, eh. <laughs> But having said that, I mean, from what you have seen of the trailer, did it do enough, you know, ignoring the unreadable text? It, it, it sort of <laughs> yeah, it looked, it, yeah, it looked great. The graphics looked awesome. Um, so. Are you surprised that it is a beta game? Um, well, that's, you know, like we were talking before, I wonder, you know, where does that lead? Is it going to be, are they going to direct stuff towards the Vita and then port it over to the PS4? Are we going to start seeing, you know, crazy stuff like that? Um, because you've already mentioned there's some great games on the Vita that aren't available and, and you know, what's going to happen well, there? I, I, I think if they were able to port things like Gravity Rush and Uncharted Across, uh, Uncharted Golden Abyss, I think PS3 owners would, would snap, you know, Sony's hands off together. Mm -hmm. um, and then I mentioned, you know, I mentioned the gameplay too, because you're talking about a different feel and, a, you know, you're playing on a, a handheld, which, you know, you start changing that up with a controller... <laughs> you know, yeah, like like having tilt features and all that other stuff where you have the screen, things like that. Don't yeah, they don't switch over well? The, some of those you can cut out though, because it, you know the Vita has two sticks, so the, the controller transition isn't as bad as it may well, look, sound. Look at Golden Abyss. Yeah, but it just depends on how much integration. You know, you know um, if there's an alternative way from using the the back touch pad and the, the front touch screen, if they're not implemented as a core gameplay mechanic of a game, mm -hmm. then you know if you were porting it across, if you were porting it across, you could probably get away with you know reducing those things out and maybe replacing them with with some of the buttons on the controller, uh, the DualShock 3 that um, you know the Vita doesn't have, like mm -hmm. you know the R2 and L2 buttons. So I don't know. I guess it depend from title to title but to be honest if we were talking something like gravity rush or um you know uncharted i don't think it would be too difficult for them to do that and you know adapt the control screen to to, to compensate for it so yeah i think you know in certain cases it it, it would be good to see some of those beat games come across mm -hmm. and didn't yeah, you have a nice. didn't you have a few you had a few games um I remember you were oh. upset one day. You couldn't turn off the touch screen. You had to play with that. <laughs> yeah. There's a few games that are like that. You know, Doctor I mean, Who in the Eternity Clock. I still, <laughs> you know, I, since that day, I still have not gone back and done it. <laughs> really? I've not got that platinum. Four trophies to do on it, and that's how bad the touch screen controls put me off it. <laughs> Well, hopefully they won't that put that case, one over. It just, <laughs> it, it, it just wasn't accurate enough, and I think, you know, that's not down to the beta and hardware itself. It's down to shoddy programming, really. Uh, yeah. And the strange thing is, they, I think the game was made by Housemark as well, or something like that, and Housemark traditionally do damn good PSN download games like Super Stardust and stuff, so for them to have their name attached to something that's crap, it's quite surprising, but... Hmm. Yeah. One day, damn you, Doctor Who, one day I'll get you on the Vita. <laughs> We've got two more stories to breeze through, I think, as well, that I think people might be interested in. Uh, we'll leave the biggest one to last. Um, I, I know some Dutch people who will be probably uh, listening to this going, we need more of it, but we'll, we'll come to that in a minute. Um, yeah, today... Um, Warner Brothers, um, in partnership with Techland, uh, announced a very interesting game called Dying Light. Um, mm -hmm. 
Obviously, Obviously we know zombie games, games are, are pretty popular. Uh, Dead Island has done a lot to help that, but obviously call it things like Call of Duty, map packs, and you know, um, it just seems that every other game in a series now has zombies in it, which is you know, yeah. Well, we all we all groan it, and we all think zombies being done to death. But then, having said that, you know, people are still buying it. So there's obviously an audience for it, and it is extremely popular. So I have nothing against it. Well, is uh, it you know after reading that is it is it going to be zombies or is it going to be because the other thing is like there's there's different plays on zombies, you know hmm. fast movers, slow movers, the biting you, they only eat brains, and if you get bit, and yeah, all that other well, stuff. Well, my understanding. This of one what? seems to be like it's daylight nightlight or day daylight nighttime kind of uh, split. Yeah, well, um, the, the game, game itself is called Dying Light. Mm -hmm. um, just for those that, that want to know what it what it's called, but um, I, I don't know if too many console players have ever heard of a, uh, a game called Daisy on PC. Um, that's an open world zombie game um, where you know it has day and night time cycles. But the interesting thing with it is that you have to kill other players to get you know supplies and stuff. And when you kill another player, that character is dead. Um, and you can loot them or you can, you know, chop out their body and use it for bait and it's quite a dynamic project and it's still very much in its early days on PC and stuff. Um, for me, uh, this Dying Light seems like it's taken quite a lot of... Uh, I'm not sure in terms of, you know, killing other players because obviously that'll come down to, you know, any multiplayer modes they put in there but it's kind of like they, they've built that game in mind with that kind of thing. I mean, one of the things uh, I remember when I said to you about this, you know, I sent you the, the news piece over on this, you were like, hmm, parkour in a super, in a zombies game, that sounds quite interesting, you know, I have to actually agree with that, you know, being able to run and do parkour and stuff would certainly add a lot to the gameplay dynamic, yeah. instead of shooting a zombie, you know. Well, no, instead of actually, clubbing them to death with a stick that you pick up off the street. Yeah, now you can actively <laughs> avoid them in, you know, a Mirror's Edge style way and I think that's actually pretty cool. Well let's face it, it's either you know, it's either goes crazy with you got superpowers and special weapons or you've got bare bones nothing and you've got to make them. I just thought that was an interesting little uh little combo yeah. there. Yeah, because I mean it works for Dead Island in that respect, you know, with weapons and stuff. You know, you you, you mm -hmm. don't get a gun and then you can use that gun throughout the entire game. It breaks, you have to repair it or you have to build other weapons, you know, you can get you can just go beat zombies around the head with a baseball bat. Um, but if you want to do more damage you can get a saw blade you can pick up a saw blade, take it to a workbench, you know, put the saw blade on the baseball bat and hey presto you got something that can do some serious damage. And, you know, to put that in an open world game like Dying Light, um, and then add the parkour element where you've got a fight or flight mechanic. Um, this definitely sounds intriguing. I'm, uh, the other thing I'm intrigued by is that it's, it's being published by Warner Brothers. Um, I didn't really think that would be. The, I didn't really think they would be the kind of people to to, to, to publish that because you know Warner Brothers are, uh, are sort of more concentrating on. Um, the DC franchises and you know knocking games out with that, but um, obviously they, they've taken a brave decision. They've obviously seen the success of Dead Island itself and what yeah, Techland yeah. are doing on small budgets. So you know maybe it will work. From could be a surprise here. I tell you that. Hmm. But the concept of it looks, you know. Yeah, and to add to that, you didn't you didn't really mention it. I don't think it's a it's a any kind of spoiler or anything. But it seems like there's a the day cycle, you're gathering supplies, and the night nighttime is, you know, when all the beasties come out, which is, you know, that's like you said, that's a little weird. <laughs> nighttime I, zombies, they're scared yeah, of the sun. Yeah, but I think it's cool. Though. <laughs> I do. I do Isn't that like a vampire thing? Like, that's a vampire thing. Uh, vampire. Yeah, thing. But I kind of like the concept of, you know, the, the whole, uh, the whole gameplay mechanic changes depending on what time of day it is. Yeah. Um, I think. Well, that know, speaks I'd more like to. to um, um, what was that Will Smith movie? The zombies. Uh, I I am alive. Or something like that. I am legend. I am legend. That was it. Yeah, that was that, that was, was kind of cool. Right. Yeah. So it's kind of like that, I guess. With the with the they weren't really zombies, but they you know. I mean, uh, same kind of concept probably. Yeah. Nighttime, all the creepy crawlies come out. That's cool. <clears throat> Another one that would probably make a great MMO, huh? 
Uh, well, <laughs> I, think, uh, I think the concept with uh, on P, you know, the DayZ project that I mentioned before on on PC is that's kind of a, an MMO straight game. So uh, that's more PvP, uh, what called player versus player MMO type of thing. So. Oh yeah. I don't know. I'd be cool. I'd be down with that. There's some zombie kind of things. So, you know, I've seen the uh, the initial concept of Day C. So, um, you know, if I had actually had a powerful gaming rig to run something like that, and I wouldn't be uh, against the idea of picking Day Z up on PC. Hmm. It's just my cup of tea, if I'm honest. But I think this this is going to definitely really appeal to console players. And now with that, you know what this show needs more of. Yeah, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, death threats in the mail. Just kidding. Break it out. Yes, uh, of course, if you haven't guessed by now. Um, I'm, I'm sure, uh, you know, our Dutch friend will uh, be broadcasting it from every uh, corner of the globe. But GTA 5 news came out today, and it's the news we've all been waiting for. Of course, it's to do with collector's editions. Uh, we finally, well, I say we, uh, Rockstar have finally come forward about what they're intending to do with the collector's editions. Um, there's actually uh, two variations. You've got the standard edition, the collector's, uh, you've got the special edition, and then collector's edition. Um, and to be honest with you, I think they're going to sell bucket loads, um, just purely on the basis of the Grand Theft Autos come around uh, once every four or five years um, so you know people are going to want something nice to kind of go with their game and celebrate the moment that you know uh, Revolution and Grand Theft Auto game came out but um, from what I've seen in terms of the collector's editions they do look quite nice uh, you know uh, the special edition has uh, I think an audio soundtrack a special embossed um, steelbook case it comes with a, a map of Los Santos um, and other areas, but it's done in the form of a blueprint. Yeah, that map looks sweet. Uh, which I thought it thinks quite. Yeah, I think it looks pretty sweet because you know. It's useful. It's interesting. <laughs> well, I think the interesting thing is, it, you know, I I've got maps with games before, and it's just like here's the game open world. It's like, but Rockstar are taking it that one step further and making it relevant to the game because it's done in the form of a blueprint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and obviously the the idea of Grand Theft Auto Five is that you're going to be conducting heists, and obviously you need blueprints, for buildings, and so on. So yeah. it's actually a really clever uh, way of putting it across, and yeah, I think that's going to be pretty cool. Neat, neat. So do they have do they have a realistic collector's edition? Comes with like a a dead prostitute that's been run over by a car or anything like that. Uh, sadly, sadly, dead prostitutes are not included. Not included. <laughs> um, but no, the the, 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 the collector's edition looks pretty sweet as well. Um, you know, it comes with everything that you get in the special edition. Um, but you also get let me think about this. Uh, I'm just trying to think what else was in it. You get a security bag. You know, like to, you, you know the security bags for storing money in. Yeah. You know, like, like the zippered. Tape. There's like um, a heavy canvas. Zip, yeah, yeah. Zippered bag. Yeah. Yeah, you'll get a, a Grand Theft Auto Five. Uh, one of them. Um, embossed with the logo, and you'll also get a, a snapback cap with the cool. with Los Santos and GTA 5 on it, and it does look pretty sweet. There's a, there's a couple of other things, and it all comes together in a nice special presentation box as well. Hmm. So um, I, th I think they're talking something like, uh, well, the game is 60 bucks. The special edition thinks about 80 bucks, and then for the collector's edition, you're talking about 150 bucks. Um, here in the UK, that works out at, uh, I think it's 44.99 for the game standard, uh, 64.99 for the um, special edition, and then 100. 19, I think, for the collector's edition. Any uh, pre-order time date limits and all that other stuff? Or? 
Oh, um, well, obviously you got you need to get your pre-orders in pretty quick because they're going to disappear and they, they are pretty limited. They have said that. There was one other thing as well, which was that if you pre-order your um, game, you'll actually get access to a bit of in-game content DLC. And I think with some of the collector's editions, you get some DLC as well uh, and some multiplayer perks and things like that. But this one is uh, specific for pre-orders only, which is you... You get a special uh, Zeppelin balloon that you can fly around Los Santos in. Hmm. Which uh, GTA men made him compelling cases when he when he gets the game, he's going to uh, hopefully see if there's any Led Zeppelin on the on the soundtrack on the radio stations, so that he can have Led Zeppelin blast, blasting out while flying an atomic Zeppelin. <laughs> But yeah, I, I don't know, I, I mean, you, you know, I, I tried to pre-order this earlier when I, I saw the news of it come out, and it was ridiculous, it took me like an hour and a half because the website was playing up, that shows you how much interest was in this. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know, I think, you know, as I say, we often lambast collector's editions, it's like, do we really need them? You know, um, with the, as you pointed out earlier, with the amount of games coming out in a year, obviously it's hard enough to buy the games that you want, let alone collect editions. But I think, um, you know, when it comes down to something, as I say, like like GTA 5, I mean, these these games come across, you know, once every three to four years, and so you know, it's not like they've jumped on the bandwagon and said, "Oh, we're going to do a collect edition because everyone else is doing a collect edition." They're, they're gen you can generally tell from the care that they've put into the, the package deals for them that you know they want people to remember when GTA 5 was out. Uh, and what they got when they bought the product, uh, as well as the experience they'll get with the game. So, yeah, GTA 5 Collector's Edition. Um, we'll try and get a news article uh, up and up and running um, that will have like pictures of all, and all the details and stuff, so people can check it out uh, and see what see what they think of it. Cool, 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 cool. But yeah, that, that's pretty much the biggest stories of the week so far. Awesome, awesome. Um, all rounded up. Uh, I don't think there's anything else that's come out on news unless it's come out in the hour or so that we've been talking. I haven't seen anything on the social feeds that, that's of major importance in terms of uh, stuff that we haven't already covered. <laughs> it's all Xbox stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's feeding the flames. Well, um, interesting little take on the news lately, and... Um, Look forward to uh, hearing again from um, Daryl next week, and uh, hopefully he'll get his. He's got some issues he's dealing with, so uh, you know we'll hopefully see him back in about a week. But uh, yeah. so what are we looking at? Fuse May twenty eighth, Grid May twenty eighth, uh, Grid two, um, Need for Speed what November nineteenth. Uh, what else we got going on? We got E threes coming up in June. Yeah. That Last of Us game. I remember hearing something about that. June, yeah, June 14th. Uh, I, I think the biggest one, I think, that, that there's going to be a sleep hit is Remember Me, which is out on the 6th, uh, 6th or 7th of June. I think that's going to be the one to watch. Hmm. Because that, that was originally a Sony exclusive. Um, and Sony passed up on it. And it's actually ended up in the hands of Capcom. But Capcom have stayed uh, well away in terms of letting just, just letting the studio get on with the game. Um and essentially all Capcom have done is uh, is invest money in it and you know it's paying off the game looks fantastic and the concept for it looks great so I think Remember Me is going to be uh, a sleep hit for this year and I think people should definitely check it out if you've got some spare cash floating around and you can't wait an extra six days till The Last of Us comes out uh, pick up Remember Me I know I'm certainly going to be picking that game up um, over the course of this year hmm. <laughs> uh, I can't think of if there's anything else. I can't. I, I was trying to think of some video games as well. <laughs> just, You're yeah. probably reverting back to your PS, trying to do a PSN pick of the week. You can't do that here. Yeah, that I isn't know. welcome here. <laughs> <laughs> no, but hopefully everyone um, you enjoyed the news on the Trophy <laughs> Lounge tonight. And, uh, you know, yeah. apologize for Daryl not being able to be here. Um, it was something that was very urgent with his family. Family should come first. And, like I said, we look forward to seeing him next week. So, yeah. I'll be tuning in. Very well. Well, thank you for joining us for this uh, broadcast of the Trophy Lounge. Everyone have a great evening, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Ah. Uh -huh.